Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. I'm Yogi Davids and in today's video I thought I would give you an insight of my experience so far of public school. I get asked about school and public school in particular all the time by everyone I meet, um, by friends and family back home. It's just something intriguing because it's different to what we're used to. So my children have been in public school for just over a year now. We actually celebrated their one year anniversary of being in public Portuguese school last week. So I've made a list of all the things that I thought would be useful for you if you are thinking of putting your child into a Portuguese public school in the near future or if you just wanted some more information about what the schooling system is like here. I have already made a video on applying for public school and the reasons that we chose a public school and those videos can be found on my channel. I'll link them in the description box and I'll also put a link to them up here somewhere. So I'm going to start off with what the Portuguese school day looks like. Now I've got three children aged nine, eight and six and they all go to Portuguese public school. My six year old is in Preescola, which is like the preschool. And then my eldest daughter who is nine, she's in year four and my son is in year three, otherwise known as Ciclo three and Ciclo four. So in the primary school years, it goes from Preescola to year four. So Preescola to Ciclo four. Ciclo I think means class. I should have researched all this before I came on, but I think it means class. Um, and that is the, the age group that it goes up to. And then after Ciclo four, it goes Ciclo five, I think until Ciclo 12, and that's like secondary school stroke college. Um, I'm still learning about that part because I haven't got a child in that part at the moment in secundaria or Ciclo five. So I'm learning and as I learn, I will share. But for now, I can only give you my experience on primary school. So yeah, so that goes up to age nine to 10. So you start at age six, five to six, and then you finish at age nine to 10. So when my daughter leaves this year, she will be age 10 and she will be going into the secondary part of school. So she'll be starting a new school. You can get schools that do go up to secondary age. It depends, I think, where you are or what school you apply for. This is more known in like Portuguese private schools or international schools. You start off from like preschool and then you can go up to your secondary years. But with public schools, you just have like a primary school and then a secondary school. So at the moment, my children are in the primary school. And I thought we'd start with how the school day works. So on a normal school day, they start school at 9 a.m. They can arrive to school anytime between 8.45 a.m. and 9 a.m. But the bell goes at 9 a.m. and then they go into class. My youngest son, his bell goes at 9 a.m. and that's when the doors open. He doesn't get to go in any earlier. He just has to wait for the gate to open. The gate is opened by his teacher. She greets us every morning and she also lets the children out in the afternoon. Whereas with my older two, who are in year three and year four, Ciclo three and Ciclo four, there are different staff on the school gate. So it's not their school teacher that's on the gates when you're in the upper years. It's, at, it's, the, it's the playground staff that are on the school gates and they are lovely and they let the kids in, they let the kids out, that kind of thing. So school starts at 9am and school finishes at different times depending on what year group you are in. For example, with preschool, my youngest, he finishes at 3.15. With my other two children, they finish at different times. My son, who is in year three, he finishes at four o'clock and my daughter, who's in year four, she finishes at 3.30. So there are different times that they finish school. With the other two year groups, I'm not sure. I'm mainly going to comment on the year groups that my children are in because that's what I've got most experience in. Um, but yeah, so that's the times that they finish school. So they start at nine o'clock and finish from 3.15 to four o'clock, basically. I hope this is all making sense. Sorry, it's all very confusing, but I'm trying to make as much sense as I can. Now with playtimes, there is a playtime for my youngest son who's in who's in preschool at 10 30 so he has a playtime from 10 30 to 10 45 and they get to use the whole playground there is nobody else playing out at that time then he goes in at 10 45 at which time the other year groups come out and have a playtime for 15 minutes they then go in class at 11 o'clock and do schoolwork and then lunchtime starts from 12 p.m onwards my youngest son who is in preschool 
He will have lunch at 11.45. They'll start going into the dining hall and they'll have lunch and their lunch finishes at 1.30. So they get from 11.45 to 1.30 to run around and play outside. At playtime, they have their own section to play in. They don't mix with the rest of the school. They've got a section where their class is where they can play outside. And I think they get to play inside as well, but I think it's mainly outside. They get to run around, but they have to stay in their area. From 12 p.m. to 12.45, it's staggered where the different year groups from year one to four come down to have their lunch. They'll have their lunch and they've basically got till 2 p.m. to run around, play around and have their lunch. At 2 p.m. they go back inside and when they go back inside at 2 p.m. they will then do their schoolwork until their school finish time, which is either 3.30 or 4 p.m. During their school learning time, um, they, it is quite strict in the classroom. There is a seating plan. They have places they have to sit, people they have to sit next to, and it's quite strict. It is learning time. There's no time to play, talk, chat, you know, have a laugh. It is learning time, which is why I think they get a long lunch time for them to kind of like release and have a good play. During their morning play, they are offered a snack. You can have a snack at school, or you can bring your own snack in from home. My children bring a packed lunch and a snack from home, but they're also, they are also able to get a snack from school, which is provided, which I pay for as well. My children take a packed lunch to school. They did try out the school dinners. I made it so that they had no choice, really, um, when they started. I had told them that they had to do two months of school dinners, and that was the school rule, because I really wanted them to try the school dinners because I feel like school dinners it's nice to have a nice hot lunch it's nice to have a nice home cooked meal not home cooked but it's nice to have a cooked meal something different to a sandwich which is what they would normally bring in and I really wanted them to try it and see if they liked Portuguese school dinners unfortunately they didn't like Portuguese school dinners and the main reason they didn't like Portuguese school dinners was because the school lunch time starts off with a soup um, and although they did quite well with the soup, there were a lot of days where they didn't like the soup. It was either cold or just not a flavour they liked or was used to. So the soup was a massive struggle. Now, in order to go on to the main at lunchtime, you have to have had a sufficient amount of soup or finish the soup. And my children couldn't finish the soup. And I kind of felt like they were force feeding themselves to eat the soup so they could go on to the main which is what they wanted and I felt bad because when they were coming back telling me that you can't move on to the main unless you've eaten enough soup was hard work and was hard and horrible to listen to knowing that they couldn't go on to the next part of their meal and um, but when they did get onto the next part of their, their meal the main lunch they really enjoyed that so it's such a shame that in order to get there you need to have had the soup um, so if I could take the soup out or had a choice where they didn't have to have the soup I think my children would, would have stuck with school dinners but because there isn't that option, we kind of went to a packed lunch. But school dinners were reported to be very nice, the actual dinner. So it was like fish, chicken or meat with like rice or pasta, bread, that kind of thing. The kids did like it, so which was good, but they didn't like the soup. There is no dessert when you have school dinners. I remember when I was at school, we used to get like cake and custard, that kind of thing, but there isn't anything like that. I think you just kind of get fruit. Actually, now in English schools, I don't think you get cake and custard anymore. I think it's more yogurt, biscuit, fruit, that kind of thing. I'm not sure. But um, here you don't get a dessert. You just go out and play afterwards. That's how the school day works. That's how school dinners work and snack works as well. Now, at the end of the school day, you are free to go home if your parents are there to pick you up, but you've also got the option of staying for after school club. Um, it's a bit like for working parents. It works really well. So you can pick your child up at 5.30 rather than 3.30 or four o'clock or 3.15. You can pick your child up at 5.30 and they can stay and play at school. Now this section from, I'm going to say from 3.30 because that's when my, I'm going to say from 3.15 actually because my youngest does stay three times a week until 5.30. So at 3.15 he then transfers from the teacher's care into the care of the after school club which is called CAF, C-A-F. I'm not sure if it's called CAF everywhere, I think it is and it's kind of like an association for parents, like an after school club and that staff there then take over. They're a different set of staff who work specifically for CAF 
and they will take over from that time until, until 5.30. And there's one teacher or one person associated with each classroom. So my youngest son will have one teacher who's associated with his class, who knows him, and who kind of coordinates the activities. And then my daughter will have someone in her class and my son in his class and year two and year one, again, will have someone for their class. And during this time from 3.30, 3.15 to 5.30 p.m., it's kind of like, I can only describe it as like play center. You kind of run around and have a play. You There are coordinated activities. So you can do, during this time, you can do creative work. So painting, drawing, origami, ball games. Um, the library's open. You can watch movies, play instruments. There is a lot to do. There are lots of different fun activities that you can take part in that my children have the best time during this time. Like at the beginning when they first started school, I said to them, right, I'll pick you up at 3.30, 4 o'clock. But then they wanted to stay to try it out, which they did do and they loved. And when I'd say, oh, it's a long day, I'll pick you up early. That no, stay until 5.30 is the best bit. So they really enjoy that part. I think it's really fun really creative you get to run around and they just have a great time so they really enjoy that um, and as i said that is offered from preschool up until year four the only reason my youngest son doesn't stay every day is because he goes swimming twice a week so i pick him up at 3 15 twice a week when he goes swimming and the other days he stays till 5 30 and at six years old he doesn't find it too much he loves it he really enjoys staying now you have to pay for this time, this extra time, and it's 80 euros per month per child, which is amazing, a really good price. So for that after school care, it's 80 euros per month. So during the period of CAF, you are offered a snack as well, which parents pay for. And the snack consists of a bread roll, a drink, a yogurt, they're drinking yogurt, and there's milk, chocolate milk or white milk. And there is also fruit. So you get the option of any of those things. Sometimes I've been told by the kids that if there's no bread rolls, you might get a brioche or a croissant as well, but I think that's very rare. I think the bread roll is what you get mainly. And sometimes in the bread roll, there might be cheese, there might be butter or there might be jam. So you get a choice of that as well. And you pay for that weekly and the cost of that is around seven euros. I'm gonna double check everything and write it here. If I'm wrong, I'll write it here. But if I'm right, then yeah, it's about seven euros. For that i can't remember if it's per week or per month i think it's per week school dinners the cost of school dinners i can't remember but i'm going to look it up and write it here because as i said at the beginning my children were having school dinners so i was paying for that so i will look up the invoice and write it here obviously now they're taking school dinners so i don't pay that fee anymore during the school hours you do also get the choice of having a carton of milk which I don't think you pay for. I think that's just from the school, carton of milk and a piece of fruit in that morning snack break as well. Okay, so that's snacks and food. With allergies and things like that, I'm not sure how it works because my children don't have any allergies, but I'm assuming you just let the teacher know. I haven't had ever had any feedback or any information to say the snack that my children bring home from school is insufficient or no good. I'm not, I don't think they're very strict on the snacks of what you bring in. My children bring in snacks that are nut free, but I'm not sure if that's a policy of the school, but I just know back in England, if a child had a nut allergy, you know, it's quite severe. So just based on that, I just, they just don't bring in nut based snacks. My children have told me on many occasions that there are children that bring in big packets of crisps and big packs of biscuits and things like that, which they do share amongst their friends and it's allowed. So you're allowed to bring in those things. There's no, um, you're allowed to bring in like chocolate. You're allowed to bring in, I don't think there's many, um, what's the word? I don't think there's many restrictions on what you can and can't bring in because my children tell me they see all sorts, um, which I think they're mainly telling me as if to say like, mummy, we can bring in a pack of biscuits, but I don't allow them to do that. I just give them what they have in their packed lunchbox and that's it. When it's your birthday at school, you are allowed to bring in a birthday cake. You are allowed to bring in like a little, like a little cake for your friends that you can give out in your own time. But in class, you can blow out candles for your birthday and have cake in your class. You can also bring in iced tea or a drink if you want to. So that's nice. 
So now I'll move on to the communication with school and how I communicate with school. So the school basically has an agrupamento and that's the school office and that's normally based in a secondary school. And when you go to the primary school here, the public primary school, there isn't anything, there isn't anything like a school office or anything like that based at the school. This is separate, known as the Agrippamento, and that is where the school secretaries are, where you'll find the school secretaries, where the communication is done to do with school. Now, what I mean by that is, when you're in a primary school in England, you'd normally go in and there's normally a head teacher's office, the secretary's office, and kind of like a reception area. You don't have this at the public school. Now I'm talking about the public school that my children go to particularly. It might be different in different public schools, but in my children's public school, there isn't a secretary's office or a head teacher's office. They do have a headmistress who is at the school, but again, I don't think she has an office. She kind of like just walks around and is just around. Um, if you have a problem where you need to discuss, you know, a change of address, change of phone number or an update on something to do with your child, you do this at the Agrippamento, at the school office, which isn't based in the, the school. I hope this is making sense. The Agrippamento is separate to the child's school. And you will go here to register any, inf any um, changes or information you have about your child. And then I think that is fed back to the teacher. Now, when I have something to update the school on, I also email the teacher. So that is how I keep in touch with the teacher. We, the teacher has our email address and I have the teacher's email address. So emails from the teacher normally consist of, you know, information about school trips that might be coming up, any tests that are coming up, any homework that wasn't completed or any extra stuff that the kids need to do is normally communicated via email from the teacher straight to the parent. If I change phone number or address or anything like that, I will email the Agrippamento, but I will also email the school teacher as well. I kind of email the school teacher as well if I'm sending an email to the Agrippamento. But anything that's based on like, my children have information about a school trip or wasn't able to do their homework or needed extra help with homework or need some extra help with something else, I will just email the school teacher and we have that dialogue via email. That's how we communicate. I also have the teacher's phone number. Now this I think depends on what, who your teacher is and whether your teacher wants to give that out. I've got the phone number for my both my son's teachers but my daughter's teacher hasn't given us her phone number. I think it's quite comforting to have the phone number. I've never, I've never texted a teacher before but it's just nice to know that if I need to I can text the teacher or even call the teacher I suppose. Um, but yeah, they have given us those details as well which is really handy. Also, if you wanted to have an appointment with your teacher, class teacher, to discuss anything, it's quite straightforward. You just email the teacher and say that you'd like to have a meeting, you'd like to have a chat about your child's work or progress, that kind of thing. And they kind of organise that and it's very simple and it's not a big deal. They'll just organise it for the next day after school and you can go in and have a chat with them, which is really good. So you're not waiting for an appointment or anything like that you can go and discuss things with your teacher if you need to at the school there isn't such a thing as parents evening which we used to have in the uk which if you don't know what parents evening is it's where you can go in i think up to twice a year to go and discuss your child's progress how they're getting on in class where they need improving where they're doing really well that kind of thing there isn't that option here we haven't had parents evening which is unfortunate because it is something I would have loved to have had. But again, they keep in touch with us via email. Children do have tests at school and when that happens, that's all done again via email. The teacher send an email to let us know when test dates will be, what the children should be revising, the time and date of tests and that kind of thing. So we're kept in the loop like that. The children are tested, like for example, my son and daughter were tested last year, they were tested this year, and then the results are shared with you online. Written information is given on how well they did. Kind of like good, very good, um, maybe excellent, or and then needed more help, that kind of thing. So you kind of get a report to let you know how they're doing in their studies. Subjects that they study at school are English. When you get into year three and four, you do English. I think in years one and two, you don't do English. So you do English in years three and four, do Portuguese studies, middle studies, which I think is otherwise known as science. You do PE, you do 
history and geography as well, um, but they're called something else, I can't think of the name, but they do study that as well. And they study arts and crafts, they do, what's the word, they do, oh, what do they call it? They do robotics, they call it, which is IT, um, which they love, they love robotics, they do music, so they do all the normal kind of classes you would do, I'd say probably from an English curriculum back in the UK. Moving on now to uniform and what the children wear. So there's no uniform, they can wear their own clothes. They are allowed to wear whatever they want really. Obviously not high heels <laughs> or heeled shoes, I'm guessing. I mean, my children, my daughter's never worn anything like that. So I'm guessing um, you can't wear anything like that, but Maybe if she did, I would be told different, but she wouldn't wear high heels. So, you know, comfortable footwear, trainers. My daughter sometimes wears her boots. Um, my sons can wear their football shoes if they want to. So yeah, there's not really any, you know, we don't get a, at the beginning of the year, we don't get a list of uniform that they should be wearing or even an idea of what they should be wearing or not wearing. You kind of use your common sense. So my boys will kind of wear like track suits, that kind of thing. My daughter wears like leggings and you can wear shorts when it's hot. You can wear vests, you can wear t-shirts. There's no real restrictions in terms of what you can and can't wear. You've just basically got to be comfortable. In terms of like hairstyles, you can wear what you want in terms of your hairstyle. They're quite lenient with jewellery because my daughter sometimes wears a necklace or a choker, that kind of thing. She wears a bracelet. So they're not very strict on those things. She wears studs and small earrings, but she does tell me, oh, mommy, you can wear big earrings. I think she tells me these things because she thinks I'm gonna say, well, why don't you wear some big earrings to school then? Which I won't do just because of safety and things like that. So, um, but I don't think it's very strict in that sense. You can wear earrings. You can wear nail varnish. It's not strict in that sense either. So you're quite free to kind of wear uh, what you like, which is really nice for the children because they love it. Um, I would prefer there to be a uniform just so that I know what they're wearing every day because for me, it's a pain of what you're gonna wear today and no, you can't wear that or yes, you can wear this. It's kind of like I find it a bit of a pain, but they love it. They love the fact that it is non-uniform and they can wear what they like. There are parents WhatsApp groups if you want to join them. I'm part of three different WhatsApp groups, which I find really difficult because I don't understand the language and I'm forever using the Translate, Translate app to translate what the parents are saying. But at the same time, I find it, I'm really grateful for the WhatsApp group because I am finding out information in the WhatsApp group, as in if there's no school today or there's, there's dress up day or today you have to bring in a box or today you have to bring in this, that and the other. So I am grateful for the WhatsApp group as well, even though I ignore most messages that come through because a lot of them sometimes are voice notes and I haven't got a clue with voice notes, um, but I'm grateful that I can find out what's going on. So with public school, there are a lot of times when my children might not have school. And this might be due to a strike, due to a teacher being off sick. Um, yeah, they're the two main reasons, which are really frustrating and which I found to be a real pain of public school. So with public school, the teachers do strike and I don't blame them because they are striking for better pay and better work conditions which I think they should do, but at the same time, it's really frustrating because nine times out of 10, you don't find out if your school teacher, if your class teacher is striking until you get to school. So you get dressed, you get ready, you get to school, and you'll normally see a crowd outside school, and that's when you think, oh my goodness, is the teacher on strike or is the teacher ill? The whole school never strikes. In my experience of the past year, I've never seen the whole school strike. It's always an individual class. So I'm guessing that different teachers are part of different groups, uh, teacher groups that might strike. And if a strike happens, then there is no school and that class goes home for the day. Um, but as I said, it's not for everybody. It, all the teachers are part of different groups and strike on, at different times. Um, and when a teacher is absent, your child gets sent home because there is no cover teacher to cover the teacher's work. So if a teacher's off sick, whether it's for one day or one week, your child is sent home and you only find out on the day in the morning when you go into school. Again, super frustrating. That's an annoying part of public school, I think, because there's no cover teacher 
and there's no one there so that your child can stay in school and still learn, they get sent home. Homework, so the children do get homework. My youngest in preschool, he doesn't get any homework, but my daughter does get homework and so does my son. I think it depends on the teacher of the class because my son seems to get homework every single day and my daughter hardly gets any homework. So I think it depends, as I said, on the teacher and the workload that they give him. But they do get homework and homework is taken seriously. It's called TPC and they have to complete their homework normally for the next day, which is super frustrating because by the time they get home at 5.30 and have had dinner, the last thing they want to do is homework. They want to relax and unwind, but we have to do homework. So yeah, homework is something that they do get. Normally English, maths or science. So dropping the kids off at school, as I said, there is gate staff or different staff that let the kids in and out at the beginning and at the end of day school. And they're, they're also the same staff that do lunch and play times as well. And the staff are really lovely. And if there's a problem, you can always speak to the gate staff who can pass the message on if you've got one to their teacher. And at school drop off and school pick up time, there is a service called Park and Kiss or Ride and Kiss. I think it's called, I think it's called Park and Kiss. Well, basically it's like an on off road to the school so you can drive on drop your child off and drive off you don't have to look for a parking space you can literally do that which is great i don't use that because i get really nervous and my children start and finish at different times so for me it doesn't work but if i had one child it would work beautifully um, and it's really lovely but for me i drive to school or walk to school but on the days that i drive to school there is always parking that's one thing, it's not congested with lots of cars. It's very, it's a nice flow of parents coming in and out and kids being dropped off and picked up. So that's a nice part of school pick up and drop off that you can actually just drive in, drop your kids off, drive off again. So that's nice. Children go on school trips and that again is communicated via email if there is a school trip, if you have to pay anything towards it. Um, in my experience, parents are welcomed to come on the school trip. They enjoy parents coming and they like parents to come because it means more help and support for the school. So that's really nice. And they do go on school trips locally and into Lisbon as well. My children, since last year, they, so for year three and four, swimming is offered as an activity and my children have taken part in swimming. So there's a school bus that takes them from school to the swimming baths and they go swimming and parents are allowed to come and watch, which is really nice. And also as part of the swimming service, they're given a swimming hat, swimming hat and a swimming bag, which is good so that they can use that when they go swimming. So that's quite a nice offering of having swimming. And I think that is it. That's all the information on public schools that I've picked up so far in terms of how public school works. Now, in terms of my experience with my children at public school and how we've found it, I'm actually going to interview them and let them give you an insight into what public Portuguese school is like and how they've found living in Portugal. But from my experience, it's been a positive one. It hasn't stayed a positive one. I think it's taken a good eight to nine months for me and my husband to feel fully like we are happy with the school that our children are in. It's been very up and down from the minute they've entered public school. We've spent a lot of time kind of watching from the sidelines, peeking through the gates to check they're okay, to make sure they've got friends to check that they're getting on all right. It's been, it's been a real struggle to be honest. And I feel like any school that they'd have gone to would have felt like that. With public school, the main issue has been that there hasn't been very much English speaking um, teachers to help us. So we found that quite hard, like dropping the kids off, having a translate app around us or an English speaking parent around us has been really helpful. I've got one lady at the school who speaks English and obviously can speak Portuguese as well and she has basically helped me so so much and without her I'm not quite sure how to how I would have coped she has translated loads for me now the children started at Portuguese public school without being able to speak Portuguese and after a year they can speak Portuguese which is absolutely amazing they translate what the teacher needs to say to me or what the gate staff have to say or if any children have a message or parents they're able to translate that for me so that I know what's going on, um, which is amazing. I am learning Portuguese, but I'm very slow. So it's been great that they have picked up Portuguese. We're so proud of them. 
Um, they themselves have found settling into Portuguese. Obviously, it's been really tough for them, but now they absolutely love it. They love school. They look forward to going to school every day. They've made friends. They can understand what the teacher's saying. They're getting the work done. And yeah, they're really enjoying it. As I said, the first six to eight months was a real struggle for them and for us. You know, there were times where we could see that they might have been on their own. The school dinner situation was an issue. You know, communicating with their friends was an issue. But now I'd say that it's absolutely fine. There were many times my husband and I were thinking to ourselves, we need to take them out of public school and put them into a private Portuguese school or an international school because we felt like that they, that would make them happier, make us happier. We'd be able to understand what was going on a lot more. We'd be able to communicate a lot easier. But actually, I'm so glad we stuck at public school because it's worked out for the best and it's worked out really well. One thing I would say about public school is the communication. We, at the teachers at the school do not speak English, so that's been really hard, you know, translating messages that we need to translate, but it's been okay. The other thing I noticed with Portuguese public school is they're quite short staffed. As I said, if a child, if a parent is off sick, then there's no one to cover that. But also during the play times and the after school times in that time, I do find that it would be better if there was more staff to watch the children. I find that because there are less staff to watch the children, the kind of children are just off on their own doing what they want to do. And they love that. But kind of at the same time, um, you know, sometimes the children do come home, they've got hurt, they've, you know, fallen over, they've hit their arm or hurt themselves and there's no one there to give me feedback on what happened like an adult and I find that a little bit tough because I where's the adult when this is happening you know you question a lot of things and the children are like no you know the teacher was there or the teacher was dealing with something else and when I say the teacher I mean the gate staff I mean the school staff playground staff so I find that a bit difficult because I kind of feel like there needs to be more staff watching the children um, so that would be one thing that is not great. What I do see from the, you know, the playground staff, the teachers, the support staff, which I really love, is the love that they have for the children. I do feel like there are lots of cuddles, there are lots of, there's lots of smiling, there's lots of playing, and that feels really good. In my experience of what I've seen, I've seen like the teachers are able to cuddle the children. The children are comfortable cuddling the teachers. You know, the teachers will be talking to the children, they've got their arm around them. When the teachers come in in the morning, the kids run up to them and greet them with a big hug. And that is male staff and female staff. There's a lot more like warmth in the way that the teacher is with the kids. Saying that, the teachers are very strict as well. So, you know, there's that side of it as well where the teachers are very harsh, which in England, I didn't think the teachers were as harsh and were a little bit softer. But here I do think they're stricter. Um, so, you know, it's it's about balance and it's about finding that when the children start school and understanding how it works here. So that is a little insight of my experience so far with Portuguese public school. I hope that helps if you are looking to put your child in a Portuguese public school. I hope it gives you an insight into what it is like, how the school day runs what the children are like, and just a little insight into public Portuguese school. If you've got any questions, please do write them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. So far, we are really enjoying Portuguese public school. And as I said, my daughter is due to start secondary at school. We're still unsure whether she's, we're going to put her into a private Portuguese, a public secondary school or somewhere else. We don't know yet. We're still discovering and learning about how that process works. But so far, we are happy with our public school. And as I said, if we could change anything, we'd put more staff in. Um, and probably that would probably be the main thing, just having more staff. Um, the kids are loving it. So we're really happy that we made that decision. And we hope they continue to love school because let's face it, if the kids are happy, then we'll be happy. So that's what we'd love. Thank you so much for watching today. I hope it was helpful. And if it, you did enjoy watching today and you found it valuable, please do give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please do. I'd love to have you as a subscriber and I will see you next time on my video. Take care guys, see you soon.